have a wonderful morning my dear 11th standard students today we are going to see the poem lines written in early spring written by william wordsworth before to that see the clip not important what we are doing but the important is how we are doing that whatever it is this is the message from the click okay students now we are going to see the author detail are you ready lines written in early spring by william wordsworth let us start this session with the introduction of the poet william wordsworth William Wordsworth was born on 7th April 1770 and died on 23rd April in the year 1850 he is one of the major literary figures of all times in the history of english literature wordsworth collaborated with samuel taylor coleridge that is st coleridge in preface to lyrical ballads marking the start of the romantic era william wordsworth's works are enjoyed by both youngsters and adults and he surely remains as one of the most important and favored poets in 1843 he became england's poet laureate a position he held for the rest of his life you know the meaning of poet laureate he is a person who has been officially chosen to write poetry for the country's important occasions we can otherwise call him a person whose poetry is considered to be the best or most typical of their country or region this poem lines written in early spring is in a form of a ballad and consists of six quatrains ballad means a song or poem that tells a story quatrain means a poem or verse of a poem that has four lines thus this poem has six quatrains that is six stanzas each stanza contains four lines in this poem wordsworth expresses his appreciation of the beautiful nature and his concerns regarding the path in which the humanity is leaning towards right let us see the nutshell of the poem now the poem narrates the feelings of a poet towards nature and the lesson which he has learnt from it the poem is set in a landscape of beauty a small woodland grove wordsworth was inspired into writing this poem when he has walking near a village of alford alford is a small village in lincolnshire in the country of england dear students there is another city named the same that is alford in the country of united states now we are talking about the village named alford in the country of england right so the setting of the poem can be associated with the beautiful scenery of alford let us move to the poem now the first stanza starts thus let me read it and you can just follow it i heard a thousand blended notes while in a grove i sat reclined in that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind 
the term i refers to the poet william wordsworth throughout this poem the poet william wordsworth narrates his own experiences with nature thousand blended notes is a phrase which means a thousand mixed musical notes of nature and it also implies an almost pervasive presence of the natural something that is akin to the omnipotence shown by the god sight means the absolute form of the past verb sat yes it is sat and it is the simple past of the verb sit reclined means to sit or lie in a relaxed way with your body leaning backwards through these two lines the poet tells that while he sat in a reclined position that is leaning back in a resting position on a woodland forested area he heard a thousand mixed musical notes of nature in the third line he says that in that sweet mood when pleasant thoughts bring sad thoughts to the mind in that sweet mood that refers to his feeling the happy thoughts also remind him of sad thoughts here he refers to the changes that society has undergone around him as sad thoughts that means whenever he feels very happy about the nature simultaneously it brings sad thoughts to his mind he tells the reason of his sad thoughts in the following lines the second stanza goes like this to her fair works did nature link the human soul that through me ran and much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man her refers to nature to understand this line we have to do some changes look at the verb pattern in the first line did nature link the verbs used here are did link now combine these two verbs did plus link is equal to linked now read it to her fair works nature linked next line the human soul that through me ran now bring the verb ran and place it between that and through now read it the human soul that ran through me and much it grieved my heart to think what man has made of man in the first two lines the poet appreciates the nature for her god like abilities of linking a human soul to herself nature's soul is not that different from humanity in the next two lines he feels very sad while thinking about how cruelly man has separated himself from mother nature wordsworth states one of his principal philosophies here it is man's innate state that is inborn state to be close to nature the second quatrain that is the second four lines move briefly away from nature to reminisce on the misery that other humans have caused each other since time immemorial the poet however takes a moment to state that nature is linked to humanity through the very idea of a soul that nature's soul is not that different from humanity and that although it has been forgotten by the rest of the world 
it is man's natural state to be close to nature this was one of wordsworth's principal philosophies that it was man's innate state to be close to nature in this stanza we must understand one more thing that the poet uses the term works in the first line that is the works of nature generally the term work has no plural form in sense one that is if you want to use the term work to indicate job task or employment it doesn't have a plural form we should not say homeworks school works and class works likewise we should not say i have a lot of works we should say i have a lot of work but in sense 2 the term work has plural form that is in order to indicate your book music or art we can say works we can say works of shakespeare a complete works of leonardo da vinci the complete works of a r rahman so in sense 1 the term work has no plural form in sense 2 the term has a plural form right we can switch over to the third stanza now let me read the third stanza now through primrose tufts in that sweet bower the periwinkle trailed its wreaths and it is my faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes primrose is a small wild plant that produces pale yellow flowers in spring season tufts means a number of pieces of grass growing or held closely together at the base the bower you know the meaning of the term bower it means a pleasant place in the shade under trees or climbing plants in your wood or garden or yard periwinkle means a small plant that grows along the ground trailed is the simple past form of the verb trail here the letter e is hidden by using the apostrophe right trailed means to grow or hang downwards over something or along the ground or to move downwards over something wreaths mean an arrangement of flowers in the shape of a circle traditionally hung on doors as a decoration or worn on the head as a sign of honor in the first two lines the poet says that in the pleasant shady place through green primrose bunches trailed periwinkle plants in the form of wreaths that is in the form of circles in the next two lines the poet says that he has a faith or strongly believes that every flower enjoys every ounce of the air it breathes they are thankful for living besides the nature that is why he says it is his own faith that every flower enjoys the air it breathes here the presence of nature as a living thing strikes again this time in the moment verbs used that is trailed for the periwinkle breeds for the flowers throughout this poem wordsworth does his best to create the idea of a living breathing world that is only a fraction removed from humanity we are in the fourth stanza now it starts like this the birds around me hopped and played their thoughts i cannot measure but the least motion which they made it seemed a thrill of pleasure hopped 
is the simple past tense of the verb hop. It means to move by jumping on one foot. Here the poet says that the birds around the poet sang, hopped, that is jumped and played. He is in surprise of these creatures. He cannot measure their thoughts of joy. Though the poet does not understand their language and ways, he does recognize that the birds are creating all these movements out of sheer pleasure and joy. Once more, the presence of movements draws a stark contrast with the immobile poet. It is nature that draws the reader's attention. So much has been said about it that it renders the speaker nearly a non-entity. He has no presence in the poem, no thoughts, no personality, no ideas. His world is subsumed by the stronger one of nature. The fifth stanza goes like this. The budding twigs spread out their fan to catch the breezy air. And I must think, do all I can, that there was pleasure there. Budding means producing buds. Twig means a small very thin branch that grows out of a larger branch on a bush or tree. Breezy means a kind of wind blowing quite strongly, having or showing a cheerful and relaxed manner. Here, the poet conveys that the growing small leafless branches, that is the budding twigs, spread out because they want to catch the flowing breeze which is sweet and light. And the poet must think that what he could do, that there was pleasure there. That is, all that the poet can do is to gather pleasure in their existence. He notices that the twigs or the newborn branches expand to catch the breezy air and he believes that twigs are enjoying the breeze and mentions that there is pleasure hidden there. Finally, he says that there is a pleasure in realizing mother nature. We are in the last stanza now. If this belief from heaven be sent, if such be nature's holy plan, have I not reason to lament what man has made of man? Here, the poet says that if it is a belief sent by heaven that it is the holy plan of nature, then he has to feel sorry. That is why he mentions the term lament. Lament means feel sorry about something. And he questions that if this is heaven and this is the holy plan of nature, then what has man made of man that is himself and his kind of separating from such joy? The poet's spirits are still lamenting, that is the feeling sorrow about the miseries of the human world. He states that the human soul is left behind to experience the misery of the human world. Now, we can understand the poet's thoughts while comparing nature with the human behavior. That is, the poet realizes that nature is a beautiful holy plan of God sent from heaven. Nature is linked to every human soul, but human beings have separated themselves from nature and have failed to realize the pleasure in mother nature. Thus, the poet ends his poem with the lament that was mentioned earlier. Have I not reason to lament and what man has made of man? Throughout the poem, there was the attempt by nature 
to heal the injured soul of the speaker that is the poet near the end despite the best efforts of nature herself the speaker's spirits are still melancholy that is sad and low thus negating that is stopping the healing effect that wordsworth claimed nature possessed it ends on a somber and a sad note the world of nature untouched by the miseries of humanity continues on while the human soul bound in its rigid cage of mortality and reason is left behind to experience the misery of the human world dear all we know that the themes of this poem lines written in early spring are nature spirituality and peace throughout this poem the poet who is very likely the speaker observes the natural world around him he discusses how impactful the images of nature are on his state of mind he was in a sweet mood but this pleasant mood leads him to deeper thoughts those associated with the nature of human kind and what has become of the human soul or spirit he moans over what man has done to man in the face of nature which contains all of us the speaker knows that although he does not have answers to many of his questions he can take pleasure from the world around him let us see the figures of speech used in this poem wordsworth uses many literary devices in this poem personification is the most common of the literary device used here in the stanza 2 line number 1 he says to her fair works did nature link the figure of speech used in this line is personification because nature is personified to link the human soul to herself in the same stanza in the line 2 he says the human soul that through me ran in this line the same figure of speech that is personification is used because the soul is personified that it runs in stanza 3 in line number 3 he says and it is my faith that every flower here also the figure of speech used is personification because flowers are personified to enjoy the air they breathe in stanza 1 line number 1 he says i heard a thousand blended notes here the poetic device used is onomatopoeia because there is a diversity of vowel sounds and a choice of cluster of consonants in the lovely phrase a thousand blended notes in the last stanza in the last line he asks a question what man has made of man here the poetic device aphorism is used because it is a statement that is presented efficiently by the poet and as this line functions as a question we can call it a rhetorical question so the another figure of speech employed in this line is rhetorical question dear students after recalling the summary of this poem we can wind up this session lines written in early spring is a landscape poem that is largely concerned with nature the poet sits under a tree and thinks about nature and its beauty his thoughts turn briefly to the misery of man and to the miseries that they work on each other the poet tells that while sitting reclined that is in a resting position 
on a woodland grove, his mind was filled with several thoughts. While he finds solace in the nature's beauty, the same beauty also reminds him of bad thoughts. He appreciates the nature for her godlike abilities of linking a human soul to herself, but he also feels grief while thinking about how cruelly man has separated himself from mother nature. He is highly appreciative of the nature's beauty. He finds delight in the green bowers and has faith that the beautiful flowers enjoy every ounce of the air they breathe. They are thankful for living besides the nature. The poet observes the birds which sing, hop and play around him. He is in all respect that is the surprise of these creatures. Though he does not understand their language and ways, he recognizes that the birds are creating all these movements out of sheer pleasure and joy. The breeze flowing is sweet and light. The twigs spread out as if to catch the sweet air. And all that the poet can do is to gather pleasure in their existence. He questions in the end that if it is a belief sent by heaven that it is the holy plan of nature, then what has man made of man by separating himself and his kind from such joy? It ends on a somber, that is a sad note. The world of nature, untouched by the miseries of humanity, continues on while the human soul, bound in its rigid cage of mortality and reason, is left behind to experience the misery of the human world. My dear students, Though the poet has described nature beautifully, throughout the poem, it mainly highlights that man is destroying nature. He therefore concludes rhetorically, emphasizing that he has good reason to lament the distress man unnecessarily brings upon himself. Finally, I say that if you are in torture, Go to nature, because nature is your best teacher. Dear all, I think you all have patiently watched this session and understood well from the very beginning to the end. And I am very happy about it. Thank you. This poem is one of the important poems in your 11th standard. So, uh, please read and memorize the appreciation questions and poetic devices well and make your test on your test note and get the parent sign and send to me through my whatsapp this is important my dear students so read well the poem and question and answers by knowing the content fully understand yourself then you can write the uh, questions in your test note okay students Take care. Goodbye. We will see in the next video. Bye.